Well, actually, it is. So, good morning. All right. Um, we have a um, we have a planned uh, interactive session today. You may you can ask me some questions, and we can discuss changes in protocol. Protocol will be talked about today. We will trot it out at the um, again next month at the um, skill sessions, uh, and it will be in force as of August. Now, uh, if you come up to a case where you need to, where you want to alter the protocol based on the protocol changes today, you'll still be okay as long as you've attended this session. So, um, these are the protocol revisions that we've, that will be included today. Uh, something about advanced airway, some changes in the CVA approach, and I'll tell you why, pain control, shock, uh, some updates on hypoadrenal shock and septic shock uh, changes in the protocol, some changes to V-fib, dysrhythmias, particularly wide complex tachycardias, um, a slight change in anaphylaxis, cleaned it up a bit, a uh, few additions to ALS assist, and then just some miscellaneous stuff to throw in for good luck and grins and giggles. Now, why are we making protocol changes? Because we attempt as much as possible uh, to have the protocols reflect not only current medical practice, but current uh, medical science. Um, and so uh, we're trying to see that all the protocols have at least some basis in uh, acceptable medical fact. And uh, yeah, yes, there are things that we do believe to be true in medical science, just like there probably is such a thing as, as global climate change. So uh, we do have some medical science out there. So advanced airway, some changes. Uh, we've rewritten it in that it allows uh, a, a, a more reasonable progression from routine ALS airway management to include the rescue airway, to include RSI, to, to, to be a stepwise thing to RSI, long-term paralytics, and then surgical airway. And I will, uh, I will define that further as we go along. We've had some medication changes. Uh, we've added rocuronium to the, to the mix. Why? Well, Sometimes you can't use succinylcholine. There are contraindications to succinylcholine. And uh, frankly, vecuronium is not available from manufacturers right now. So we're having to get a long-term paralytic uh, answer, which would be rocuronium. Rocuronium will turn out to be a nice drug because it can be used for both induction of RSI and it can be used for the long-term paralytic. Now, it is not, and I will go over this more carefully, it is not the drug of choice in my book for routine RSI. Okay. We will talk a little bit more about ketamine, uh, emphasizing ketamine more for some, uh, for some portions of the RSI, and then we have some significant changes in your pretreatment Atropine is being totally downgraded to the point that we'll use it only in children six and under. Now, no more routine for presumed anxiety about bradycardia. You will still use atropine if they become bradycardic. Lidocaine is being totally downgraded. There is no, well, and we'll go more. So to be used essentially only pretreatment for um, reactive airway disease only. So let's talk a little bit about rocuronium. Rocuronium is a non-depolarizing neuromuscular blocking agent. So it does not have any of the uh, acetylcholine emphasis that 
succinylcholine does. So there's no cardiac effect of rocuronium. You don't have you don't have to worry about bradycardia. You don't have to worry about hypotension per se. If they become bradycardic hypotension, it's from something else. It's not from the drug. Succinylcholine would augment the anxiety about succinylcholine is it will augment uh, the the acetylcholine effects of uh, or the, the, the vagal effects that uh, are common with intubation. So it's a non-depolarizing neuromuscular blocking agent, which means it, it blocks the uh, acetylcholine transmission into, into the, uh, the neuromuscular junction. Uh, it's indicated for RSI when sucks would be contraindicated. Now, sucks is contraindicated a lot of times in, uh, in neuromuscular disorders such as uh, myasthenia gravis, uh, hyperkalemia, because it elevates uh, potassium. Um, it is, however, a slower onset of action and a much longer duration of, of action. 45 to 60 minutes versus six minutes for succinylcholine. So when you use rocuronium, you are locked into ventilating that patient, bagging that patient until the drug wears off. Okay, slower onset takes about um, 60 to 90 seconds usually whereas succinylcholine is usually fully effective in 30 seconds. Dose of rocuronium is easy to remember. It's a milligram per kilo. So indication would be for RSI when sucks is contraindicated or unavailable. Um, uh, Scamania County has used uh, rocuronium for about three years because uh, at a, at a time they could not get succinylcholine. Um, Long-term paralytic when VEC is unavailable. It's, uh, it's, it's the, it's the go-to drug for, uh, for most ERs too. Uh, our ER uses rocuronium. I don't think, you, I don't think I've read any, any use of VEC in probably years. Rock uranium has taken over for that. Now, contraindications, other than a, quote, known allergy, none. And, of course, the patient you're going to be using rock uranium is not going to be telling you much about a known allergy, are they? Probably. Now, so here's your ideal intubating conditions are 60 to 90, minute, uh, 90 seconds after administration, whereas the ideal intubating condition with succinylcholine is about 30 seconds. So to this, uh, it's a, it is not my preferred, all the studies that I've read show that, quote, ideal, when you define ideal intubating situation, it's still best with succinylcholine. Most relaxation, the most everything, you know, it's just more ideal. Super long duration of action, though. There's really no reported, by no reported side effects. The side, worst side effects, of course, is failure to intubate, but the, that's not really a side effect. The, the, the side effects, there's no significant cardiovascular effects. Now, unfortunately, there is a shelf life. It's about 12 weeks and needs refrigeration. Now, you've got those nice little refrigerating units on AMR that are left over from using uh, uh, chilled saline, so they would be perfect for that. The effects can be reversed with acetylcholinase in uh, inhibitors, and there's a, uh, uh, I guess, a drug which we are not going to be carrying to reverse. There's no reason for us to want to reverse um, paralysis. The, the, the neurosurgeon might want to do it. Remember, when, when you bring a patient in paralyzed, long-term paralytic, we can't do a neuro evaluation of that patient until it wears off or until you reverse it. So if it's, if it's, if it's really necessary to do a neuro evaluation, uh, it can't, the, the, the long-term parallels can be reversed, but it's a little touchy. 
So, um, I believe that uh, Jeff has it ordered. It may actually be almost ready to go on the, now I know some of the other agencies have, a, have ordered it because, and, and if you're out of VEC, it's on, it, it can be on your, on your rig now. Now, ketamine. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about ketamine under when we get to pain control too, but in this sense for RSI, it's a sedating agent. And the dose we're going to go for is, a t is two milligrams per kilo IV. Um, it's probably the ideal agent for sepsis, uh, including pediatric sepsis, if you have a suspicion of pediatric sepsis. Um, it's good for COPD and asthma, has a tendency to increase, uh, to d cause bronchodilatation as well as increase ventilation. Uh, there's a sympathomimetic effect, which means it'll raise your blood pressure and raise your heart rate. You have to keep that in mind because it's a, that would make it, um, well, you'd have to be aware of that if you're giving, using that on a, on a cardiac patient, for example, someone who's ha who already has some ischemic stress. Um, contraindicate, one contraindication is severe eye injury in which you think there's increased pressure in the globe because it causes increased pressure in the eye, increased intraocular pressure. Now, those are pretty rare. Uh, relative contraindication, I said cardiovascular, it does increase sympathetic flow and the, there's a potential, it's not proven, uh, just a potential, theoretical, uh, but we talk about science, you have to talk about the th science, because it does increase, it, there's the potential that it could increase intracranial pressure slightly. Now, that being said, uh, I know Life Flight is using ketamine as the go-to sedative for RSI when they have a head injured trauma patient who's, who's, who's hypotensive, who's in shock. So trauma shock, it might be the good, because it does increase sympathetic stimulation and so you may, you may, it may help to get your, you know, we're trying to get our blood pressure up to, with head injury, we, the sweet spots, 100 to 110 millimeters of pressure. So, uh, maybe the good drug for that. Um, nice little monograph here, American Journal of Emergency Medicine. Um, basically, bottom line was that both Atomidate and Ketamine had similar safety profiles for hypoxia, blood pressure, heart rate, intubation success rates in for pre-hospital flight crews. You can translate to that to paramedics. So, it's sort of your choice, although I would aim at, now, we don't like to use Atomidate in pediatric sepsis, and arguably you wouldn't, you might think, mm, maybe I shouldn't use it in adult sepsis, and the reason uh, we don't use it in SEP in pediatric sepsis is that it suppresses uh, adrenal output. So you run out of stress hormones. Theoretically, again. But, you know, you would have a choice here. So, where would we have it in our protocol indications for respiratory insufficiency? We're talking about COPD, uh, asthma, um, airway obstruction. Oh, sorry, back up on this. We started, uh, started right here for the advanced airway protocol. So why do we do an advanced airway? Remember, to me, an advanced airway is a cuffed endotracheal tube in the trachea. Now, it can be a surgical airway, but it's still a cuff. That's the ultimate advanced airway. We do have, because we are doing airway management, not just intubation, that is, um, 
I mean, my emphasis is on airway management, not just on whether you intubate every patient. And so uh, the rescue airway has its place, and, uh, and we do CPAP a lot, which is airway management. So indications for an advanced airway, cuffed ended trachea tube would be respiratory insufficiency, airway obstruction, unable to protect the airway, a GCS of less than eight, which means that they can't protect their airway. So start out from the top, 100% O2 assisted ventilations, BVM suction is needed, apply nasal cannula at 10 liters per minute for apneic oxygenation. We're gonna flood that pharynx and hypopharynx, and as long as there's no airway obstruction, you get positive flow of oxygen to the alveoli even if they're not breathing, even if they're not ventilating. As long as you have high, high concentration of oxygen molecules in the hypopharynx and pharynx, an intact trachea and bronchial tree, air, oxygen molecules will flow down to the low, to where they're low concentration called apneic oxygenation. Now, we don't like to leave them like that for a long time. But So pulse oximetry, capnometry, I love capnometry of the, 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 the blow-by capnometry. IVIO secured cardiac monitor. Unless the patient needs spinal precautions positioned by aligning the ear external auditory canal with the sternal notch as close as possible. That's your, gets, gets your best position. Attempt intubation either by a direct or video. If gag, now, if a gag is present and intubation unsuccessful, now rapid sequence induction. Pretreatment medications, atropine 0 0.02 milligram per kilo for pediatric less than six years of age, so five and under, if they're getting sucks. And then any, pedi any pediatric, and you can, we can stop, for all intents and purposes, you can stop, you can say someone is not a, a, a pediatric size patient if there are signs of, of uh, secondary sexual characteristics. If that's just a guideline. Now, if, if you give a kid, any pediatric kid, and we, we, we've redone throughout the thing, we've taken out child and made peds. Okay, just to be consistent. Um, any peds case getting a second dose of sucks, and that's gonna be very, very rare. You should at, give them atropine because now you have fully charged their, um, uh, you, you fully charged their vagus for stimulation. Now, then lidocaine, one milligram per kilogram. Consider for patients with reactive airway disease. Now, I went going through all the studies we cannot, and all the recommendations, we cannot find any conclusive data that shows that lidocaine protects or does anything for intracranial pressure. After all this time, and I'm beating you guys to death over this, you don't have to we don't have any science that says, yeah, this is what we should do. So we'll just take it out. Except for, it does appear that it does make a difference in reactive airway disease. So particularly asthma, but other forms of reactive. If you got wheezes in there, it probably will do better with some lidocaine. So it's a standard dose, we didn't change that. Okay, so for the vast majority of your patients, the adults, you now have shortened 
what you have to do before you actually get to doing airway. I want you to spend more time on making sure they are oxygenating as well as we can before we, before we crash them. So what are we going to crash them with? Etomidate, 0 0.3 milligrams per kilo, max 20 milligrams, but not for a pediatric, uh, pediatric patient with septic sh presumed septic shock. Your alternative is ketamine, 2 milligrams per kilo, max of 200 single dose. And I would recommend it for status asthmaticus, severe reactive airway disease, pediatric and septic shock. I'd also recommend it, well, you could think about it for trauma patient with probable head injury in shock. Okay. Alternative to, would be, if you don't have either of those two, or if you love this one, is Versed. Five milligrams for peds. Obviously, it would be the good drug if the if the patient were in status seizure. Then, succinylcholine hasn't changed. However, alternative, if sucks is contraindicated, is rocuronium a milligram per kilo. No, these these haven't changed. Cricoid pressure until intubation is successful and ET cuff is inflated, ventilate the patient uh, after fasciculation stop with succinylcholine. They won't fasciculate when you use rocuronium. Um, I don't know how many times they, we actually see fasciculations. You guys don't write it down very much. I don't think it's real, I don't think it's real common in the field. There's probably too much else going on. Um, ventilate the patient four to five times with the BVM. Remember, you will not get paralysis with, rock, with rocuronium for until about a minute to a minute and a half. And if you attempt intubation before you have adequate ideal condition, then you're going to have difficulty with that intubation. Uh, attempt endotracheal intubation, if it's difficult, you know all the things to do for it, reposition, burp technique, Eschmann catheter, NASCAR technique, King Vision, laryngoscope, have your partner do it. I didn't write down, but I expect no more than two attempts for each medic if, you know, if there's more than one medic on the scene. And after two attempts, if there's not, not another medic, go to, go to your rescue airway. Now, if relaxation is inadequate, and I've only seen this a couple times, then you can repeat the dose of succinylcholine. I notice it doesn't say repeat the dose of rocuronium. You've already got, you've already got 60 minutes ahead there. I don't, you know. No, if intubation repeatedly unsuccessful, insert eye gel or perform a crike if you can't ventilate the patient with the eye gel. Needle jet for a patient under 12. Treat bradycardia per protocol with atropine. If it happens. And if you need to halt intubation, do it. Hyperventilate the patient, give them atropine, go on. So. Upon successful intubation, confirm ET tube placement by what? Capnography and secure it. Capnography means a number and a waveform. Push the record button so that we get a copy of that. Maintain ETCO2 in the 35 to 45 range, except if you're, if you're dealing with head injury, you want to be closer to the 30, you want to keep it at 35, low end. Versed, 5 to 10 milligrams, PRN for post-intubation sedation. Now, please document your GCS prior to sucks, prior to rock. Um, keep, maintain normal ventilation rates, most people at about 10 to 12 per minute. Um, Maintain blood pressure at a, for head injury at about 100 systolic at least, and ETCO2 of 35. If 
you can't establish or maintain an adequate airway, transport the patient, including trauma patients, to the nearest hospital for airway control. Continue to re-monitor, record that, recheck and document ET tube placement after every patient movement or change in vital signs, push the button and record it so we have a record. Succinylcholine and VEC do not affect the level of consciousness and should always be used with a sedative, same with rock uranium. Documentation includes visualization of the cords of applicable number of attempts, five-point check and equal chest expansion, ETCO2 device, and reading reconfirmation of placement after any patient move. When you identify the need for a long-term paralytic after successful intubation, they are, the reasons are, patient is successfully intubated, confirmed by capnography, and beginning to arouse and become combative despite the use of a sedative. And you risk losing the patent airway, and you have an extended transport time. If you're two minutes from the hospital, please don't give them the rock uranium. We're stuck then for, or VEC, because we're stuck for an hour, although a lot of times the, the ED doc will like it because they can send them right to the CAT scan, they don't have to worry about it. <laughs> so, but it's not the best thing to do. So, for long-term paralytic, VEC uranium, 0.1 milligram per kilo IV. The alternative is rock uranium, one milligram. Just have to understand the difference. It comes in a different size thing. Sedate with Versed. The pediatric dose is here. Uh, routine recommendations for ventilation. Patients on the monitor, you can generally tell when they're getting light, even though you've got 60 minutes of paralysis, you can tell generally when they're getting a little light on their sedation. Remember, sedation usually has to occur every 15 to 20 minutes normally. Uh, their heart rate goes up generally. You can follow it that way. Now, if you're dealing with a trauma patient and they're tachycardic anyway, that's kind of touchy, but you know. Uh, just thinking in your own mind, when I've got a long-term, if I've got a long-term paralytic and I've got a 60-minute transport, I'm probably going to have to give them sedation at least three or four times in that time period. This is why we do not want you to use a long-term paralytic on a uh, status asthmaticus patient. Fine to suck them to get control of the airway. But from that point on, if you do a long-term paralytic, we can't tell if they're seizing. The only way you can tell is if you, if we manage to get down, and, and most places don't have it available, you get an EEG to the, to the ED department, and we run an EEG at that time to see if they're seizing. So we just assume that they would be seizing. So we don't use long-term paralytics on, on, on um, uh, status asthmaticus. A um, couple of things to uh, consider with VEC and with ROC is that uh, patients who have hepatic failure or renal failure have a prolonged paralytic time. So instead of 60 minutes, it may be two hours. Wrong button, Mark. What do they do here? Uh, I don't know what I did here either. There we go. Got back on that one. Okay. Questions on, and you can look at your little answer sheet here and see that we went over all the things. Did we go over all the things? Do you have any questions? There's an arm up there, but I think it's a stretch. <laughs> okay. 
Now, protocol revisions for CVA. Why are we doing this? Well, we're, I'm, I'm anticipating um, one of, one of my jo the joys of my life is sitting on the, uh, uh, on the uh, steering committee for the EMS and trauma for the state, and so we get all the preliminary stuff. I also sit on the pre-hospital TAC. And the stroke, the cardiovascular and stroke TAC has reviewed the literature and actually decided to do something scientific too. And so they've, they've changed the, they've changed the uh, state mandated stroke triage tool to include um, a stroke scale so to encourage appropriate diversion of patients from non-interventive centers to interventive centers because the major major vessel strokes particularly middle cerebral artery strokes with major stroke findings um, are best treated by intervention now, or at least a significant portion. And there have been five major studies that uh, show around the world that showed that uh, intervention was, uh, and by intervention I mean usually uh, a neuroradiological intervention with uh, actually physical removal of the clot um, by the neurointerventionalists. Um, that the patients did significantly better when they had the availability of neurointervention. So the stroke TAC, which was a group of about, turned out to be about 40 persons, about 35 of them were probably um, either stroke nurses or, stro or, or stroke neurologists, and the others were hospital administrators trying to protect their turf. Uh, you know, we have no problem down here, but you know, there are some, pla there are, uh, I think Pierce County uh, has something like 15 hospitals that think they're stroke centers. They have some of them have some really good food for the paramedics too. <laughs> you know, they you know, the, their stroke care is possibly you know, questionable, but otherwise. So, the the state has come up with a with the tool, and they've added, and they 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 chose in their wisdom the Los Angeles Motor Scale, the Lambs Scale. Uh, you know, I suppose if you have a patient who who's got some speech impediment, it's the silent, uh, silence of the lambs, possibly. Oh, 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 I know, I'm getting bad now, so. <laughs> the lamb score is a three item stroke severity assessment measure designed for pre-hospital emergency department use. It reasonably accurately and with sensitivity predicts the presence of large artery anterior circulation occlusion. Now it says with high sensitivity, which means, and, it, and the, 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 the sensitivity is, the sensitivity is how many false negatives you have. So, they don't, you know, so it predicts that you, yes, you've got a stroke, but the specificity is how many false positives you have. So it's not as specific. So when you say, yeah, this guy's, if you use the scale and it said, well, yeah, they've got a high likelihood that, yes, indeed, this is a stroke, but it's sort of 80% roughly or 60% likely that this is a major, major vessel stroke. But still, that's a really good deal. Stroke and 60% could be benefited by 
intervention, possibly. So it's a very, it's a very good, very easy to use thing. We've been doing essentially that for the last year, because I told you if you had a patient who couldn't raise their arm, couldn't raise their leg, were profoundly aphasic, that they would go to the intervention center. This is essentially what this does, only it writes it down in a number, makes it easier to, to follow. It's not the only stroke scale. There's half a dozen of them out there. But it's to be used to identify stroke patients for direct transportation. You can read diversion from a level two stroke center to a level one interventional center. Now, you still do the FAST assessment. You can do both of these things at the same time, but you have to understand that you're working together. So, so what's the FAST? So, FAST, the basic FAST is lack of facial symmetry when smiling. Um, arms drift or fall when uh, holding arms outstretched. And the most accurate way of doing that, by the way, is to have them close their eyes at the same time. Speech, not able to repeat a simple phrase without mumbling or slurring or memory loss, aphasia. And then time, time hasn't changed. That's the time last normal and it could be the time they woke up with the stroke. It could be the time that they, uh, um, of symptom onset, if they actually looked at a clock or if their family noticed it. So time last known normal. Then you apply the Los Angeles motor scale. Facial droop, if, it, if they get a zero, if they don't have one. If it's present, they get a one, a score of one. Arm drift. Zero, if it's absent, drifts down one, falls rapidly or can't, or can't raise, they get a two. Grip strength, normal is a zero, weak grip is a one, no grip is a two. Now this is written, this will be in your protocol so you don't have to commit it to memory but it's not terribly difficult anyway. So you could have a t potential there of what? Four, seven points. So with the CVA then, we will have you protect and maintain airway, place patient in a lateral position on paralyzed side if present. By the way, if they have a totally paralyzed side and they're laying there and they can't move at all, you don't have to do a fast and you don't have to do a lamb's motor scale. You, they've already failed. <laughs> If they're totally comatose from their stroke, uh, automatic. You know, you, know, you know that and I know that. Apparently the neurologist didn't know that that was the way it happened because they, they wanted to make sure that everybody got a fast. So, um, maintain airway, high flow to assist ventilation, uh, if you think they're having an intracranial bleed with, with uh, coma, with increased intracranial pressure, you can intubate, target the patient at 35 ETCO2. Try to keep your oxygen, we don't want it, we don't want a lot of free radicals running around. Uh, we want an SpO2 somewhere in the 94 to 98 range, so you have to titrate to that. This is not a cardiac arrest at that point. Um, secondary survey, EKG, EKG because we're, you know, for the dysrhythms that are related to the strokes. IV, transport the code, patient code three, lights and sirens if they meet the following criteria. Less than eight hour onset, of the following symptoms, aphasia, facial droop, unilateral weakness or paresthesias, inability to understand others or verbalize understanding, loss of vision in one eye or visual field, vertigo, sudden onset, persistent, progressive with headache, went to bed normal and woke with symptoms, 
and just let the facility know of a code 3 stroke. Patients meeting stroke CVA criteria will be transported to PH Southwest, any patient with a LAM score of 4 or 5. We're assuming that these patients, we're assuming that all your patients will have had a FAST already, but there's no score on the FAST. So, LAM score, 4 or 5, any patient 80 years or older. Why? Because uh, they're m much less likely to get routine um, TPA at age 80. Uh, our interventionalists have taken people in the 90s to interventional with good results. Symptoms more than two hours, why? Because it takes any, any hospital system X amount of time to work people up. Now, we're getting really, really, really good at it, but historically, it's about 90 minutes. Hey, that's an hour and a half. So we have a three and a half hour window for most patients to get simple TPA into them. Uh, incidentally, a lot of the patients who need, who get intervention, get TPA to start with and then go to the intervention. Um, anyone with suspected intracranial hemorrhage would go to PH Southwest because that's where the neurosurgeons live. Signs of profound paralysis, aphasia, or coma. So they will be failing the LAM score. But if they're also just comatose and you can't do a LAM score on them, they obviously had a big major stroke. And most of those turn out to be injured. You know, it's the little old lady who, wakes up, who, who doesn't wake up in the morning and is basically comatose and breathing funny and has, is hypertensive and it's had an intracranial bleed. Now, most of those, unfortunately, do not qualify for neurointervention either because they don't. Now, you can go to the closest stroke center, whether it's PH Southwest or Legacy, for symptoms two hours or less, and they don't meet, they don't have any of those above criteria. And notice that there's no criteria in there that says type of insurance. So remember now, acute subarachnoid hemorrhage, generally an aneurysm, may present with sudden severe headache, neck pain, near syncope, and then, as you're evaluating, may have a normal fast exam. It's the, it's the premonitory bleed, it's the warning bleed, and then they bleed again some, some hours to days later. So what we do is try to fix them before that happens. But with a no, even with a normal fast, if you have a suspected intracranial bleed, it goes emergently to PH Southwest, because that's a neurosurgical intervention emergency. Okay, Question, questions on LAM score. Questions on stroke. Pain control. I'm going to digress just for a second, but an interesting thing about pain control, because it's interesting that they're pushing us on pain control at the levels of emergency medicine, they're pushing at uh, an EMS, the um, NEMSP, the uh, uh, National Association of State EMS officers. It's one of the KPIs, one of the key performance uh, indicators that's being promulgated nationally as well as locally. Pain control, pain control, pain control. The FDA has said, you know, the Controlled Substances Act don't allow for 
opiate medications for controlled medications to be given on a protocol basis or a standing order. They can only be prescribed individually to individual patients. <laughs> so, uh, well, my first, my first response was to let the FDA or the DEA, the folks that work, uh, you know, they're mostly lawyers and some things like that, know that, you know, we will not give them any pain medication for their cardiac uh, issues, for their, for their fractured bone. They, we would definitely w withhold that, but that was thought to be probably argumentative. So there is a, uh, there are, there's both a Senate and a House bill that's being, that's, the House has really good, uh, really good support of it. They've got about 150 people uh, co-sponsoring it. The Senate bill only has like five people co-sponsoring it, and we're trying to drum up business for that now. Uh, but, and they were going to, it, both bills, which are basically mirrors of each other with slight changes, would, would allow for uh, EMS to be not under the, the standard uh, 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 D, uh, DEA regulation, so it's just an interesting and confusing thing. Now, so pain control, ketamine. Ketamine is a nice drug. Now, remember we we talked about it for sedative, uh, for for RSI at two milligrams per kilo. Um, uh, at the central nervous system, most ketamine is a dissociative anesthetic which means you sort of dissociate from reality. You sort of stand, you're standing back looking at things happening or um, spacing out, if you will. Uh, uh, you know, ketamine is related to PCP in, in some, some amount. So, you know, it, it can cause hallucinations which are basically dissociative things. Uh, it may increase blood flow and slightly increase intracranial pressure at the cardiac level, increase inotropy, increase chronotropy, sympathetic stimulation, pulmonary bronchodilatation, slight decrease in respiratory rate, but, and then if you give it really rapidly, which is why we don't like you to give any drugs, right? If you, if you give uh, fentanyl rapidly, really rapidly, you can get what's co called a constrictive chest syndrome, and they ba basically can't, can't breathe. They can't move their chest, rigid chest wall. Uh, but with uh, ketamine, if you can, you can cause apnea with rapid administration, or you can cause apnea and seizures with rapid administration of lidocaine. So we don't, you know, we don't give any drug rapidly, okay? Except maybe in cardiac arrest because you can't hurt dead people. Now, and then there's bronchorrhea. Remember, anything with two R's and an H is bad. Uh, so bronchorrhea means lots of lots of mucus and s stuff in the in the bronchial tree. Increased salivation, increased ocular pressure. Okay. Onset IV is 30 seconds, lasts five to 10 minutes. Onset IM, three to four minutes, duration 30 minutes. Uh, another reason the duration of ketamine IV is fairly close. That's why it's another why it's really a, a good drug for the use for use in. Um, uh, with succinylcholine for RSI because it has almost the same time profile. Versed has a longer time, so you have, you know, if you if you knock the person down with Versed, they stay down longer than the than succinylcholine will wear wear off long before that. So these are ketamine is nice. <clears throat> now here's your dose dependent effects. For sedation, we usually use more than a milligram per kilo IV. So we 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 looked at all the stuff and came up that two milligrams would be the best dose. For anesthesia itself, a good dose is 0 0.15 to 0 0.3 milligram per kilo. 
and for dissociation, which, and we use it in the ED, you guys will not be using it, but for dissociation, uh, we use 0 0.5 to 1 milligram. That's what we call um, conscious sedation. Because the patient is still able to manage their, you know, their own airway and usually, usually, so. So, for pain control, we decided, well, I'd li we'd like the 0 0.3 milligram. That's been pretty well tested around, and there's some good, this is a, uh, another American Journal of Emergency Medicine uh, thing, low-dose ketamine versus morphine for acute pain in the ED. Um, there were 45 patients that they tried on this, and uh, the pain analog scale decreased by five in both groups, so uh, there was essentially no decrease, no difference in the patient's sensation of pain with, uh, and, and relief of pain when they got either 0 0.3 milligram per kilo of ketamine versus 0.1, 0 0.1 milligram of morphine per kilo, which is standard dosing. So it was equivalent. But here's the best one. Low-dose ketamine improves pain relief in patients receiving intravenous opioids. Duh. I mean, it's a, you know, I mean, if it relieved pain without it, it's going to augment it if it has it. And we can use really low doses. And there was no difference, really, between the morphine plus ketamine Morphine dose at uh, plus ketamine at 0 0.15 versus morphine 0 0.3. This is a real confusing little slide, but what it shows is because it's a it's a pain reduction, is that compared to morphine alone, both both do, both additions decrease the pain 100 percent. It went from a decrease of two to four across the board four decrease. So they went from my pain scale is eight and I dropped to six with morphine. My pain scale is eight and it dropped to four. Nobody ever gets totally out of pain, I guess. So, um, and rather than come up with other doses, we will, we will sit with the 0 0.3. Yep. 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 And what's the dose on CPAP? Yep. Yeah. That's true. That's 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 a good point. That's a good point. And we do have I do have that dose on uh, at somewhere in here too. Now, pain control. Side effects of ketamine. Emergence. Phenomena. Well, we treat emergency phenomena. So when people have have bad, you know, bad dreams coming out, uh, it's simply treated with a little Versed. 0.25. I mean, uh, 2.5 for adults to five, whatever. Depends how nice you feel. Uh, usually, only occurs with the bigger doses. Now. It says greater than 0 0.5 milligram per kilo. Uh, I don't think I've seen any of the, uh, any of the, we've, we've done a few now, um, CPAPs, CPAP um, sedations with, mild sedations with uh, ketamine. And I don't, I haven't seen or heard that granny or someone came out and was, you know, wildly combative and reliving her life in the 20s, you know. So. Um, I don't think that's, that's not real big yet. Sympathetic surge. Anticipate possibly a little tachycardia, maybe a little bit more hypertension than yet. You don't have to treat it generally, just be sure that, so relative contraindication to use it if you have known ischemic heart disease. If the patient is, you know, commonly taking nitro on a regular basis, I think I might use something, just use pain medications. Um, laryngospasm. 
If you go slowly, push it slowly, it's less likely to have any laryngospasm. Relative contraindication, if they've had prior laryngeal surgery or injury, uh, you can usually reduce uh, this by just simply positioning the airway. Um, in little kids, we use, if they get excessive, if they get a little striderous, they may have, they probably have excessive secretions, and atropine dries that up pretty quickly. So there aren't too many better, and I, at the, do, at the doses we're using, I, I don't anticipate a great deal of issues. So, well-established use for RSI, particularly when sepsis or obstructive airway, safe to use as an adjunct with standard opioid therapy for refractory pain. Now remember in the pain thing, we're treating acute pain. I don't want to see fentanyl and ketamine given to these guys who are chronic painers. Unless, the, you know, if, if he's got chronic back pain and he's got tons of opioids at home and he's wearing a couple of fentanyl patches already, don't give him more fentanyl and ketamine unless you can see the broken bone. Or he's having chest pain, cardiac pain. Yeah, you could. Uh, I'm, I, I'm not sure I've read anything about that for muscle spasm. You already have, and within the pain protocol right here, you already have the ability to use Versed if you have muscle spasm for those back pain, you know, acute back injury, acute things where you can actually physically. You, you can see that there's a muscle spasm going on, or you can feel a muscle spasm going on. Now, I wouldn't, I wouldn't change. I'm sure it would work well. You know, we use, we, we use, we use ketamine, we've used ketamine uh, many times hauling people out of, out of the woods or in long transports, Skamania County, the upper ends of, uh, uh, you know, uh, of Clark County even. Uh, with the reach and treat folks, they're, they're, they've got it on the protocol. And I, I, I recall a specific one where a guy had, he was in a ditch and had been in his car wreck and been in the ditch for almost 24 hours when they found him. And he was in a lot of pain and he was not responding at all to, to fentanyl. I mean, it was, just wasn't doing anything because they were bouncing around, getting him out. And so they gave him some. They gave him ketamine at a at a pretty good anesthetic dose, almost the sedating dose. Uh, he was so stoned when he got to the ER that um, that he couldn't participate in his own care because he couldn't understand what you're saying. He couldn't say he was happy as a clam though. <laughs> he wanted to thank everybody because he really felt really good for about an hour, you know. So. Indications for acute pain control. Well, why are we going to do pain control? Facilitate packaging, transport, prevent exacerbation of symptoms, alleviate discomfort. So cardiac chest pain, abdominal pain due to dissection, A, AAA, et cetera. Musculoskeletal pain due to traumatic injury, DVT, disease. Burns, chest wall pain causing splinting. Side effects of pain control are CNS depression, hypotension potentially, or hypertension. Some people react, and, and with ketamine, you can certainly get hypertension. Somnolence, which is one of the things you're trying to get, I guess. Allergic reaction. Now, we don't have morphine available anymore at our direction because I don't like the histamine effects of morphine. I don't personally like the drug because it makes me throw up. Uh, respiratory depression, nausea. Avoid use of narcotics for chronic pain syndromes. Now, appropriate medications, fentanyl. Give in 25 to 50 microgram 
equivalent increments. Titrate to pain. Pediatric dose is one to two micrograms per kilo. May, and you can give up to, without anything, up to three microgram per kilo total dose. So for a 100 kilo guy, that could be 300 if you need to do that in the long term. And, and surpri not surprisingly, Skamania County, um, sometimes North Country with hour and a half, two hour or more transports have gone up to and over that limit. Which is why it would be nice to have, for, for that kind of long transport, to have something to augment, like the ketamine, to augment it so you don't have to, first of all, you don't run out of your, your fentanyl. I mean, how much fentanyl do you guys carry? 800? Well, uh, yeah, you're probably good for that then. But you have to call if you're going to go over 300. Um, or over three mics per minute per kilo. Rapid injection may cause respiratory arrest or chest rigidity. So give it over a 30 to 60 second period. We have not seen a case of that yet because I think you guys are giving it appropriately. Ketamine as an adjunct with the fentanyl and the dose is going to be 0 0.3 milligram per kilo IV over 10 minute period. Side effects include hallucinations, anxiety, panic attacks, very uncommon. If they have those things, give Versed. Zofran, the dose is 8 milligrams IV for nausea, one time dose. Versed, 2 to 10 milligrams IV for muscle spasm. Now, I'd be interested if you were giving it simply for pain and you'd give them ketamine for augmentation, I would be interested in feedback as to whether the muscle, whether they've had muscle re relaxation relief. I suspect they probably will have pain relief which will translate to I don't have muscles, I don't have any muscle trouble either. All patients obviously monitor for respiratory depression, hypotension, cardiac rhythm, treat discrepancies as appropriate. Okay. You want a break? I want a break. Okay, let's uh, reconvene. Um, I had a request to talk about duration of action of ketamine. Now, so IV onset of action is 30 seconds, duration 5 to 10 minutes. I am duration of about 30 minutes with a sh shorter. Now, when you're going to use it for augmentation of opioid, you can figure that your, you know, if your if your usual dose of fentanyl lasts 15 to 20 minutes pain relief or longer or sometimes not that long. Whatever the duration of your opioid is, it'll probably double 
the duration of pain relief and improve the so if you give an effective dose of fentanyl let's say you've given uh, an adult um, 100 micrograms of fentanyl and you're still having some pain you augment it with some um, ketamine you should probably get improvement and it should last I would guess for about 30 minutes at least so you can transport you probably most of you will be at the hospital before you have to worry about it again uh, I think that's Marty what did you think about you know one to two minutes to give the ketamine yeah, I know it, it did. It did say t it did say ten minutes, and that's not that's not reasonable. I mean, I, you, you you sit you sit there, uh, uh, you know, you get a spasm of your hand, you know. No, you don't slam it. You don't slam anything. No. Okay, shock. Uh, Hypoadrenal shock. Uh, Addison's disease is otherwise is no. It's it, adrenal insufficiency, otherwise known as Addison's disease. Addison was a physician scientist, uh, and basically, it just means it's a lack of cortisol or cortisol stimulating hormone. ACTH comes from the pituitary. So it's lack of cortisol, which is made in the adrenal glands, or lack of adrenal stimulating hormones. And it can occur with chronic steroid use, because when you take more steroids, like for asthma or for um, uh, Crohn's disease or whatever, you take more cortisone than your body normally makes in a day suppresses the adrenal glands and the pituitary. So it doesn't produce ACT. It doesn't have to. It says, hey, we get, we've got more than we've ever made before anyway. We're happy. Uh, some people have inherited adrenal hypoplasia, which means the adrenal glands simply don't put, produce adequate cortisol. And then hypopituitary conditions don't produce the ACTH, which makes the adrenal gland produce it. Glucocorticoids or steroids, cortisol is one, is nonspecific cardiac stimulus that activate the release of vasoactive substances. In the absence of corticosteroids, stress results in hypotension, shock, and death. So these are the stress hormones that are produced by the adrenal gland that manage to keep your blood pressure up and your cardiac, cardiac system functioning normally. Addison's disease, or hypoadrenalism, is precipitated by a stressor. It could be an illness, recent surgery, trauma, or cessation of long-term steroid therapy. Now, people who are on, people who have adrenal hypoplasia take cortisone daily by mouth. When they get sick, particularly children, if they can't, if they're, when you're sick, sometimes you're nauseated and vomiting. You can't take the steroids. You can't th take the steroids. You have probably, in that case, maybe a 24-hour window of getting steroids into it. So smart money is if you're, if you're sick and throwing up uh, is to get injections of steroids so you can't throw them up. But some people forget that, or sometimes they stop taking steroids for some reason, they run out of money. Symptoms. Well, they look like they're dehydrated and or severe vomiting and diarrhea associated with actual lack. So it's, if, you get, if you get the flu and you start vomiting, and you 
don't have enough steroid, then you also dehydrate and start having more nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. Often have stabbing pain in the abdomen, low back, or legs. Hypotension, shock. So it's one of the things to consider when you're asking a patient, you know, what medication are you on? That's what we want to know. If they're, on, if they're normally taking prednisone every day and they've been sick for three days and now they're hypotensive, you got a pretty good guess that they maybe need to have some more steroids. Hypoglycemia is common with low steroid. Loss of consciousness. Obviously, they're in shock. Loss of consciousness goes together. Treatment goal. They all have to have electrolytes, so they need electrolyte solution replacement for their dehydration. You're going to start that with normal balanced salt solution. Volume replacement with balanced salt solution. Steroid therapy. So you can suspect hypoadrenal shock, Addison's crisis with known hypoadrenal state, which you get from medic alert, patient's history, caregiver history, parent's history. Suspected if the patient is on a high dose chronic steroid. Give them a fluid challenge and give them some steroids. Solumadrol, you can give the standard dose up to a double dose, so 250 milligrams is not too much. IV, pediatric, two milligrams per kilo IV. Septic shock, couple changes. Septic shock is the leading cause of death in non-coronary ICU. So, uh, and we probably put for suspected sepsis, we probably have two to three times the number of people we admit to the hospital, to the ICU, than we do for STEMIs. Uh, third leading cause of death overall in the United States, a lot of old people now. Uh, more than 1.6 million persons in the United States, more common than heart attacks by far, claimed more lives than cancer. The mort combined mortality rate is comparable to the combination of lung and breast cancer together. So we should have a, we should have a, yellow or, or puce colored ribbon kind of thing and, and you know have some have a run for sepsis. <laughs> yeah, or a walk for sepsis or maybe a crawl for sepsis even. <laughs> Twenty billion in hospital costs related to sepsis in twenty eleven. It's a lot. So consideration for septic shock. Now septic shock is the biggie. Known or suspected infection so when you walk into the nursing home and you get that heavy hit of, of UTI, uh, you know that, uh, you know, that the suspected infection here with two or more of the following, either temperature greater than 38 centigrade, which is 100.4, or less than 36 centigrade, which is 96.8. Some of these little old people don't mount a fever with their infection. They become hypotense, hypothermic. Respiratory rate of greater than 20. Heart rate greater than 100. Or an ETCO2 less than 25. Why that? Why is that? Well, we can do a pretty accurate ETCO2 now uh, on the blow-by or the little side draft nasal cannula. And ETCO2 is a reflection, you know, if it's low, they, they could be DKA, and they're trying to blow off acids, or they could be lactic acidotic from sepsis, and they're responding by blowing off CO2 also to try to improve that. Now, remember, you only need two of the following, two of those. If two of those above and blood pressure less than 90, it's only one time blood pressure, by the way. It's the first one you get if it's less than 90 or the subsequent one that's 90. You know, it doesn't count if you've given them 250 cc's of fluid and now it's 98. 
Mm -mm, it's what you found them at. So less than 90 or altered mental status. And of course, the nursing home says, she's not the way she was. And when did you last notice the way she was? Last week, you know. <laughs> so, but if they're, if they're hypotensive and they have possible sepsis, then that is a septic shock alert and you can transport that code three. If they're normotensive and even though they have those other things and they're not altered, Trans their LOC is good. Transport them, code one, and tell the nurse taking over. I think that we think this is a septic, uh, a sepsis alert. We think this is a septic patient. But we're, we don't need to transport everybody with a normal blood pressure or sitting there chatting with you about their family. If you think they have sep if they think they have some signs of sepsis. We don't want to go code three with everything because we're not, we're not saving anybody on that. But if they're hypotensive, yes. And of course, if they're hypotensive, we treat them with other things too. If they're hypotensive, you give them fluid challenge. If they're not responding, you give them what? Dopamine still. If they're, if they're bradycardic and hypotensive, I would give them an epidrip. Okay, ventricular fibrillation. This is an article uh, in resuscitation. Uh, comparison of defibrillation efficacy between two pad placements in a pediatric porcine model, pig model, baby pig. You cute little pink baby pig. And the, and the test was between pad placement AP versus um, an AP, versus the, our standard pad placement across the chest. Success race rate was almost doubled in the AP placement. Limitation, obviously, pig sample. And it was a fairly small sample. However, um, many of the manufacturers, and I think the emergency department at Southwest is for, for um, cardioversion, they're choosing AP placement preferentially. I think the cardiologists are choosing it preferentially too, based on experience. So what I want to change a little bit is, I'm not going to beat anybody for it yet. Uh, um, I did, you know, so the VFib program, identify absence of pulse and respiration, continuous CPR for two minutes if an unwitnessed arrest, defibrillate, and I prefer, I would recommend AP placement of patches. Now if it's, if it can't be done because of the size of the patient, because of, you know, you don't have enough crew, but if you've got a full pit crew there, it's not that difficult to roll them and slap it on. Now, so defibrillate then at 200 joules, escalate injury to 300 to 360. That's the recommendation of our manufacturer, which happens to be uh, physio control. Now, Zoll has a slightly different thing. The hospital went to entirely Zoll things for other reasons, but uh, you don't need to worry about that. An unwitnessed arrest within two minutes of continuous CPR, IV balance sol uh, solution, ET, CO2, or in the pit crew, we're putting it, we're placing an eye gel often. Uh, drug therapy, begin drug therapy after the second shock. And you can give epinephrine and antidysrhythmic in the same cycle, but it's not necessary. Now, uh, Mo Dia over in, uh, at TVFNR is going to mandate that his people do that sequentially. You do epinephrine in one sequence, do 
amiodarone or lidocaine in the next sequence. Uh, continuous compression CPR. Um, nothing else has changed. Uh, dr drug selection administration is the last analyzed rhythm. Don't pause compressions to confirm rhythm uh, unless the patient becomes responsive. When they reach up and grab you, you can, you can look at the, what the rhythm is at that point. Uh, epinephrine dose is the same, a milligram IV or IO. Analyze and defibrillate. If V-fib persists, I'm going to stick with amiodarone. Although, you know, the, for those who weren't here the last time, the rock study showed no significant statistical difference between amiodarone, lidocaine, or placebo in patient outcome and uh, survivability to leave the hospital neurologically intact. Now, there was a slight edge for both drugs, but not statistically significant. You had to, you had to understand how the study is set up. When you s analyze the subsegments, there was clear effect of drug, either drug, in witnessed V-fib. Obviously, witnessed V-fib, we think, well, we're going to call the patient. Well, I mean, we're going to call 911 quicker. We're going to get people there, and you get citizen CPR. It was actually a significant number, uh, almost 70 percent citizen CPR, which is pretty, pretty incredible by the end of that study, because it started out at about 45 percent. Uh, so, considering that both drugs had effect, we kind of had to weigh the thing. The lidocaine is a bit cheaper. Uh, amiodarone is pretty cheap nowadays. We're kind of we the, the the study that we the the study drug that we used in the test in the in the rock study was not the drug that's available to you. Uh, it's a slightly different formulation, but I've asked, and nobody t is telling me the way we're getting this drug now, amiodarone, drawing it up, we're not getting any foaming of any significant, et cetera. So, and we use amiodarone for other things. So we're going to stick with amiodarone as the go-to drug, for, and it particularly for witnessed V-fib. Now, if you don't, obviously you may not know it's witnessed V-fib at the time you get there. So we'll just use it for V-fib not responding to shocks, just like we did. So if amiodarone is contra contraindicated for any reason, we go to lidocaine, 1.5 milligram per kilo. If you have multifocal, the wide complex tachycardia, torsades, or known magnesium deficiency, uh, mag sulfate can be added also to it. Now. If V-fib, VTAC persists after three shocks, consider AP placement of that deep, change your deep fib. If you're doing standard placement and you're not responding to three shocks, consider moving the placement. Now, in Portland, if you have gone five shocks, they will bring in a second defibrillator and they do what's called double sequential defibrillation. And so you have one placed this way, and then you have an AP one. Now, it is impossible. It is humanly and paramedically impossible to deliver the shock simultaneously. There's always a slight delay. My guess is, and they've had a couple, of course, depends on who you, it, 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 you know, statistics are statistics. We haven't seen statistics on it. It's a small sample size. They've got some survivors after even seven shocks. Um, but my guess is it's the placement of the pad, uh, patches rather than double sequential. I can't, I can't see any science that, you know, if you burn me once, you burn me twice, makes it even any, any better. I mean, there is. And there, 
Yes. So what they do is charge the thing up, and the medics go, mm. <laughs> and they. Or, or they say, or say, on one, two, three, go, you know. Yeah. Let, let's just say there's very, there's very little science. Uh, there's very, there, there are no controls. There's no controls, double-blinded studies of this. Um, no, not that I know of. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, then nothing else has changed in that thing. Um, uh, continue uh, analyzing defibrillation, epinephrine, etc. cetera. Uh, amriodarone to full, to full dose, 300 milligrams to start with, and then 150 milligrams after the, uh, on the second dose. Uh, if ROSC maintain O2 sat of 94 to, it should be 98, 96, 98, ETCO2 of 30 to 40, monitor waveform. Okay, a couple miscellaneous changes. Mm. I tried to clean up the techie dysrhythmia protocol to make it a little bit more, and this is one of these things, I, I always hate to do this, but I'm, we may have to, we may have to do a, a a bubble diagram kind of thing to make it, I don't know. You know, or we'll just bring you in and beat you each time that, so, tachy dysrhythm, ventricular tachycardia, stable, with adequate perfusion. Amiodarone, 150 milligrams over 10 minutes. So you give it slow again. Repeat. 150 milligrams after 10 minutes if VTAC recurs. If VTAC is refractory or torsades or a TCA overdose, magnesium sulfate. If VTAC persists, call it unstable. Now, ventricular TAC, unstable. Sedate them, sink cardiovert. Starting at 100. If recurring VTAC or persistent despite 200 joules, amiodarone per protocol. So that's really no change. And mag sulfate as, uh, as, you know, if indicated, if you've got torsades. Why complex tachycardia of uncertain type, WCT? that you think is supraventricular. Why do you think it's supraventricular? It's too fast for number one. Let's say, let's say you've got granny at 85 and she's tacking along at 240. That's not gonna be VTAC. VTAC people don't go that fast unless they're kids. So, and sometimes you're lucky in your WCT, you see obvious uh, P waves, you see things that make you think that it's supraventricular, and you're suspecting. But so you get a wide complex tachycardia that's stable, regular, monomorphic. Now you can try a denicard. Unless this is a known WPW. How do you know it? They tell you. Or you can identify, clearly identify, that the wide complex tachycardia is due to a delta wave, the upslurring from the P wave to, the, to your QRS is a delta wave. It's not uniformly wide. And then, if the WCT persists, if they're unstable, you could cardiovert them. Or, Okay. Now, superventricular tachycardia, sinus tach, 
consider the problems. Why are they tacking along sinostack? You don't have to treat the shock. You don't have to treat the rhythm of a sinostack other than treating the underlying cause. Atrial fib flutter, no hypotension with a rapid ventricular rate, diltiazem, 0.25 milligrams, or verapamil, 5 milligrams, depending on what we can get, with the same contraindications. Be cautious, you don't, you don't have to not give it, but be cautious in patients who are on oral beta blockers, just because you're going to get an augmented, may get an augmented effect. Now, we often give people on beta blockers, we give them calcium channel blocker in the ED. There's no reason you can't too with some reasonable precaution, which is you've got an IV in, you've got, they're not standing up, they're not sitting, uh, and you've got, and you can give them some calcium after the fact if they could become hypotensive. Give it slow. Use it only with narrow complex SVTs or supraventricular rhythms. No wide complex tachycardias with verapamil or diltiazem. Don't use if you think there's a delta wave or a known WP deba. What we, the reason we don't want to use a drug that blocks the AV node with a, with a delta wave WPW because then the only, the only pathway is the aberrant pathway and you get that reentry circuit VTAC or you could. If the patient's hypotensive after the calcium channel blocker, fluids and 250 milligrams of calcium will do it. AFib flutter, unstable with rapid ventricular rate, unstable cardiovert. Starting at 100, sedate. PSVT, PAT, if stable, vagal maneuvers first. We're doing an augmented vagal. Have you guys done, tried the augmented vagal valsalva maneuver yet? Okay. You want to tell them? of this uh, technique, but basically it's the, it's uh, to simulate a vagal tone uh, in a patient that is otherwise stable, uh, that you don't have to immediately cardiovert. You can try this maneuver. And uh, what we use is a syringe, have the patient blow into a syringe to their ex level of exhaustion. We have them in a uh, supine, but kind of semi-recumbent position. And then at the end of their period of uh, effort, then we lay their head down and lift their legs rapidly. And that augments the, the uh, response, the vagal response. So it's been, you know, two for two so far with my efforts. And I think uh, it's worthy if you have a patient that isn't, uh, you know, morbidly obese or what have you. I know you all have different situations you're going to run into, but it, in a reasonable patient, you can give it a try. Yeah. No, no, no. No, they, these were cooperative. These were cooperative patients. So, you know, the alternative of giving a denicard, that's pretty unpleasant as well for people. You have to really warn them that they're going to have this period where their heart's not going to be beating and, you know, there's gonna, they're going to feel like they're going to pass out. So. Yeah. But it beats the alternative of continuing in the rhythm for a lot of them. Now, the I, I suppose the alternative would be to have them blow in their whip their legs up and stick their head in a bucket of ice water. <laughs> a lot of these uh, patients will have these uh, rhythm disturbances when they get at home and sometimes they'll take them in with these techniques effectively. Just like with uh, BP, uh, with vertigo patients uh, using the epi maneuver. So, somewhere in that line. Uh, it's, we, we'll, we'll, get, we'll, we'll tell you about that another time. That's no, not in your orders. That's not in your order. Next protocol update. Okay, um, and so if the, if the cough, the Valsalva, and the augmented Valsalva maneuver don't work, and, the, and PSVT is persisting, adenocard is your drug of choice. Contraindication would be second-degree block, third-degree blocks, allergies, known WPW, 
caution in asthma, pregnancy, patient on Tegretol, dipyridamol or on dipyridamol. Remember, it is ineffective in AFib and A flutter and not indicated. Now, it may diagnose your AFib and A flutter in a rapid tachycardia for you, then just don't give it more adenocard after the fact. Uh, if PSVT persists and there's no hypotension, you could use diltiazem or verapamil. Same precautions we already, we already talked about. If the patient's unstable and you get to call it unstable at almost any point when you're sync cardiovert. And you can start with a PSVT at 50. Okay. Questions about, I think that cleaned it up and made it more obvious as to what you can and what you can't use. Now, anaphylaxis, we cleaned up the protocol. It was cluttered, it was uh, a little silly, and they're having the same problem at the, at, at the hospital uh, uh, also being a little bit confusing. So, anaphylaxis, severe reaction. I moved IV epinephrine right up to where it belongs, which is at the beginning. As you know, you know, I used to be totally in love with steroids. I thought that no one who should die without steroids. Well, now I think no one should die without an epi drip. Um, IV epinephrine, and I want you to give it as a drip rate. And the simple drip rate for the adult is a milligram of 1 to 1,000 in 500 cc's, which is 2 micrograms per cc, started at 1 cc per minute, no brainer, and increase as needed, titrating to heart rate, blood pressure, PVCs, etc. Pediatric dose is 0 0.1 microgram per kilo per minute. That's actually the dose for adults too, but it's easier to remember at the, at the simple rate. Notice I didn't have any one to 10,000 IV. I don't have any, and I don't have, and of course we never have one to 1,000 IV. That's what the hospital is worried about is that their protocol for the nurses might, have, might be interpreted the nurse could pick a milligram of one to 1,000 as an IV rate, which is not a good idea. Um, that's, they're cl that's cleaned up now. Alternative dosing, when, you, when you've got a severe anaphylactic patient, dyspnea, wheezes, l shock, laryngospasm, and you're having, tr and you're ha maybe having a little problem finding an IV site, get the epi into the patient, IM, 1 to 1,000 IM for an adult, 0 0.3 milligrams, for pediatric dose is 0 0.01 milligram per kilo with the max of 0 0.3. So most kids would be in the 0.1 to 0.15 kind of range. Start at IM, get your IV in, and then start your IV drip. Remember, you can start lower or slightly lower then. We don't know how fast it's going to be absorbed, I am, so it's going to be, some of it's going to still be on board. But I don't want, failure to give epinephrine is still the number one cause of preventable or probably preventable anaphylactic death. You got to give the epinephrine. Now, caution for a patient with a cardiac history over 50. We have given lots and lots and lots of people with known cardiac disease who are anaphylactic. We've given them IV epi. And you know, in the, in the ACLS stuff, the cardiac stuff, if you've got bradycardia and hypotension, by definition, that person probably has cardiac history. You, we use IV epinephrine drip because it is a very elegant treatment. By elegant means you're using, you're using it, you're dosing it the correct amount. When you, when you use I, I am epi at 0.3, you're shotgunning the patient. You're just giving them way more than they need because you don't know any better. 
sort of like what we used to do with with glucose, giving everybody 25 grams of glucose, you know, and then and then they were their gluc their their insulin glucose control was totally messed up for about three days because he didn't need that much. We don't need that much. Same with epi. It's an elegant thing. If you give 0.2 milligrams for uh, an hour, you've given 0 0.12 milligrams of epi. Now, same, same other protocol, no changes. Uh, um, monitor, air, airway, Benadryl, Medneb, Solumedrol. I, we probably can throw, ultimately we can throw the dopamine out probably because I don't think with the epi, IV epi you're going to ever need dopamine. Additional odors for bee sting. We changed it. I said search for the stinger, rubber tourniquet above and below stinger, remove with gentle scraping, Remove tourniquet. We took out sticking epi into the into the wound. That seems to be a little bit overkill. Besides that, what if they have ten stings? <laughs> All right. Small additions to the protocol or just updates. ALS assist protocol. EMTs can assist with ALS procedures. Properly trained EMTs, that's the test, properly trained EMTs, are allowed to assist paramedics with performance of the following procedures. Placement of 12 lead. EMT may notify responding paramedic of 12 lead interpretation. This goes for like places like North Country or places where they, you may have a life pack available but you don't have a medic at the scene when they put it on. You can. And, and this is consistent around the state. There are places, gosh, there are places that don't have paramedics. Um, EMTs can insert drip tubing into fluid resuscitation bag, perform blood glucose determination by finger stick, put in the eye gel superglottic airway. When they're trained, uh, District 10 is carrying, I think they still have King Airways that they can put in. Uh, Narcan intranasal, when they're trained for it, epinephrine IM for anaphylaxis, draw from vial to syringe. There's a big uh, corresponding with medical directors around the country. There's a big thing now they're, they're saying, hey, is anybody, the EpiPens are getting really expensive. Yeah, not like they haven't been. Is there, any, is there anybody who's having their, their EMTs draw up epinephrine? We responded, yes, we've been doing it now for, what, five years, six years. You can draw it up and give it on a weight-based doses. As an EMT for anaphylaxis, I am 1 to 1,000. Other miscellaneous changes. I took glucagon out of the beta and calcium channel blocker overdoses. Glucagon is just too damn expensive now. It's now in the $230 a pop range. Uh, so, and, you know, that's so far down, down the protocol, one thing you don't have to mess with. I don't think, and, and there are many of my colleagues who don't believe that there should ever be a paramedic who has to give glucagon to a hypoglycemic patient. <laughs> so we, we may take that out of the equation ultimately. but. It's still in there for hypoglycemia only. Uh, in the EMS no CPR thing, we m removed EMS no CPR verbiage from your protocol because we don't have an EMS no CPR form anymore. We have the pulse form, living will, DNR order, and so we've cleaned up that language. Uh, I said that we've changed everything with child and children, we changed to peds. Um, we've added, um, because it's been ordered now and should be, should be on board with AMR now for congestive heart failure intubated a PEEP valve to give 5 to 10 millimeters of PEEP positive index respiratory pressure, sort of like CPAP, but a PEEP valve to assist in 
intubated congestive heart failure. And ketamine preference for mild sedation during CPAP rather than sedating them with Versed, I would, we're, we're preferring because obviously you're treating, treating, you know, primarily lung and congestive failure people, uh, you get less sedation sedation. Now, the nice thing about sedation, you know, I said it's fine for you guys to use sedation, mild sedation during CPAP if the patient requires it. Uh, not all the patients will because you're paramedics and you can, you can monitor how they're doing. Just like you can give CPAP as a paramedic to a patient who's hypotensive. That's ordinarily a contraindication to CPAP. You can give it because you're a paramedic and you can evaluate how the patient is doing. So sometimes you get these people who will have blood pressures in the 70 range, but they're conscious, they're able to cooperate with you, they're able to otherwise do the CPAP. Try it. If they get worse, if they get more hypotensive, stop it. If they get better, hey, you're winning. A couple of things about, okay, that's the end of the protocol, protocol changes. Here's a couple of things. We've been having a problem with the, uh, our IV sites. The, IV, uh, the problem is when the patient goes off to CT scan, we use contrast often. And contrast goes in under high pressure quickly, and it's kind of viscous, so it's got more pressure. And the IV site fails at the catheter. It pops apart. Problem is the way we've been securing it, taping, in some instances, the tape go. The tape has been placed over that connection, that hub connection, and the, and the IV and the tech can't get to it quickly. So. You have to remember to screw that thing together real tight. And then, and then place the tagoderm dressing or tape over the catheter hub. Don't tape over the IV hub tubing junction. Secure the IV tubing with tape. So this is kind of a picture, courtesy of John Griffith, how we want to see this done. The no tape zone. So tagoderm over the catheter hub, all screwed together tightly. No tape over that tape on tape above it. Pretty simple. Okay. Well, we find my case reviews. Do we have any questions on the thing? Have we answered all the test questions? The quiz questions. <coughs> don't forget in another year I'll change all the protocols again. Just, it's sort of like ACLS. We, don't, we, we, we just change the, we don't change the test question, just the answers. All right, first case. This is a great case. Um, First of all, an amazing case, but it's also a great case. 58-year-old guy out for a morning run on the Lacamas Lake Trail. His friend saw him in distress, helped him to the ground, he didn't fall, and then he had a cardiac arrest. His friend started CPR, apparently called for help. Uh, police came and an AEG, AED shocked the patient, police had an AED and shocked the patient once. EMS had to park and hike three quarters of a mile to the patient. I think it may be an exaggeration, three quarters of a mile, but that's, a, that's the way they felt. <laughs> Past history of a cabbage times four in 2008. He said a left, left bundle of rice. Now, what you want to see in the patient states this. So this is already a good sign, right? So patient supine, good CPR, BVM, 
going on by ECFR, East County, and Vancouver Fire Department paramedics. Without CPR, patient's unconscious and unresponsive. With CPR, patient groans and writhes. So I guess they were sort of testing. Watch what happens when I push here. Watch what happens when I don't. <laughs> Did you really hike three quarters of a mile? Skin's cool, pale, dry, no vital signs, lung sounds clear, course V fib, D fib times one. I presume um, that was not counting the AED D fib. And you shocked once. Okay. The shock produced a loud, loud cry from the patient and converted to an organized rhythm with a pulse and increased LOC. He cries out during chest compressions, second shock. He went to V-fib again. Second shock at 300 joules also caused him to cry out, and he swore. <laughs> Converted then to an organized rhythm with a pulse. Rhythm was assumed to be torsade after amniotor and magnesium rhythm stabilized with strong pulses and BP. LOC and improved to conscious and alert, able to answer questions, to give medical history. Seven to ten chest pain. He, thi he thinks it's cardiac pain versus chest wall pain. Difficulty catching breath. Um, O2 sats went up from 84 to 99. Um, 12 lead was done. Showed a sinus with a uh, LBB. They began hiking out with the patient. It's pretty good hike. Pretty good hikers carrying a patient out. He get you know. Uh, Call that only nine minutes. Um, continue CPR, BVM. Um, well, at any rate, so he got his shock. This is a thing. Moved to stretcher, hiked out, had no more problem getting there. Um, this is some of his rhythm stuff. Uh, CPR going on. Um, he got nitro spray. Fentanyl, chest pain is four of ten. Arrived at PS Southwest without any problem. There's his 12 lead. Does show a nice left bundle branch block. Can't read anything into that, of course. Um, you did the re you did the review. Yeah. Um, Patient went to cath lab emergently, had no evidence of any graft occlusion, no evidence of any, of any coronary occlusion whatsoever. Placed on amiodarone, remained stable, um, basically showed no evidence of a, of a, of a STEMI. Um, his left ventricular ejection Fraction was 30 to 35 percent, which isn't great, but probably just a little stunning from his recurring VF and shocks. Um, he then had a biventricular ICD pacing device placed so that he could, in case he goes to V fib, V tac again, it'll hopefully take care of it, and he won't be three quarters of a mile down the path. Um, that was a great case, Re uh, really amazing. First of all, he, had good C he apparently had good bystander care, early response of a AED, then as quick as could be. You have any comments on it? Uh, I felt strongly that he should not be a deputy. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <clears throat> well, and that and that's a theoretical question. Obviously, it's hard to argue when it works, uh, the uh, uh, or appears to work. We don't know which one worked. Uh, I don't see. I don't really see. 
I don't really see a, a rhythm on this that uh, that I I don't know if you did did or didn't capture the um, uh, torsades what you thought was torsades. I just don't have it. You know, I don't see a torso now. And here's here's my theory and and questionable science on it. If 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 torsades occurs because of prolonged QT syndrome, uh, amiodarone is a QT prolonging um, drug. It's a type three drug. So. Um, I'm not sure it makes scientific sense to add prolonged QT drug to a patient who has prolonged QT. Now, that being said, you're changing the QT prolongation, so it may still work. Now, if you had a patient who was on oral amiodarone and was and you could see that they had QT prolongation you wouldn't give them a drug such as um, a Haldol that would prolong the QT thinking oh that might kick them into torsades you wouldn't give them a tricyclic drug if they're on a tricyclic and they're getting a wide QRS I don't want to give them amiodarone because that's going to make them more likely in my mind in my thought process to go to now that being said maybe if you just change the Q once they're already in torsades if you just change the QT segment that might improve it it might not we don't know the magnesium might have been the thing that did the difference can't tell now so ordinarily if I have a uh, a torsades, I would probably opt for using lidocaine other than amiodarone because lidocaine is a type one doesn't doesn't work on prolonging doesn't cause QT prolongation. But it's it's hard for me to be now aspirin. I still would have given them aspirin. You know, just because somebody has CPR and and shocks. If you had CPR and shocks and the guy wakes up and you get a 12 lead and you have a clear STEMI, you give him aspirin? Sure you do. Yeah. So I don't, I won't complain about that. Nope. I don't complain about anything when you, when you have a patient that came out this well. <laughs> now, if the patient hadn't done well. <laughs> okay. All right. This is one where I think we have a little confusion in our in our orders that, or at least understanding some. There's a patient who was shot in a shot in a police chase. This is this is the guy who robbed a bank. Now he's shot. He was clearly not from uh, not from Clark County because uh, in his in his eluding everybody, he decides to take an exit. Uh, off the freeway, turning toward the um, um, arena out, out at the fairgrounds, where the county sheriffs live. <laughs> Whoops there. So uh, he is lying supine in the road, surrounded by police cars and officers in heavy rain, covered with a yellow blanket up to mid-abdomen, and occlusive dressing in the left upper chest, with agonal respiration and, but a carotid pulse and unconscious. Two gunshot wounds on the left side near heart. Skin the cyanotic warm wet after initial bagging skin warm, pink warm wet directly after transport initiated skin blue cold wet during transport needle decompression performed. Uh, whoop, EMS arrived, oh, okay so here's the EMS arrived, patient assessment, heart rate taken, assist ventilations by police with BVM, fast patches, Lift to gurney via backboard to the ambulance, full trauma to southwest. Became pulses and apneic almost upon getting in the ED. Radio report by Q crew one changed to asystole, chest 
decompression, intubation attempt on successful assist ventilation, eye gel placed, fluids wide open, arrived at Southwest, patient care transferred to ER. So that's his initial vitals of 100 weak respiratory rate, it's, uh, weak pulse, respiratory rate sick, shallow agonal, EKG normal sinus rhythm at 100, uh, uh, then EKG pulses, electrical activity, GCS is always a level three. So why, why did this come to my attention? The you notice you didn't see anything in there about CPR or compressions because the interpretation of the, the, the medics were discussing this and they felt that in the case of a trauma, um, we don't do compressions and that's not true. Uh, the orders, which I can read for you, for CPR and death in the field protocol. The patient is a pulseless apneic victim of a multiple casualty incident where resources of the EMS system are required for stabilization. Pulseless apneic of multiple casual, in so you don't need to do CPR then. The patient is a victim of blunt trauma or penetrating trauma to the head and has no vital signs in the field. So for non-head trauma, now as a general rule, by the way, if you have a patient who's pulseless, apneic, and no cardiac activity and blunt trauma at the scene, that patient's usually remarkably dead. But in this case, once they had decided that they're going to transport, once they had decided they're going to think about intubation, once they decided they're going to, then, they, then this patient should have had compressions going on. And so needless to say, the trauma surgeon was a little bit surprised when they came rolling in with a needle in the chest, IVs, and et cetera and no compressions. Even if there was really nothing to be done, I mean, I don't think this would not have made a difference in this case. But it's, you know, just to clear up the, the orders, it doesn't say any place in there that for victims of penetrating trauma with not counting head injury that you shouldn't do something. And if you're gonna transport a patient you do the full full bore no matter what. That's a basic rule. We don't have, it's, it's illegal in the state of Washington to transport a dead body in an ambulance. So I don't want you to call that person dead. You're going to be doing compressions and everything you're supposed to be doing. Did the right thing, decompress the, try to decompress the chest, probably wouldn't work in this case. Probably the patient has massive cardiac or great vessel injury. I haven't seen the post on it. I'm sure there would be a post done. Probably said, he'll probably say di died of penetrating trauma. <laughs> Natural. Okay. Code three, short of breath. 58-year-old patient standing on a front porch, tripoding, shaking very hard, face is blue. Per patient's wife, patient has some teeth pulled in the last few days. And last night told her he was, he was short of breath. Well, that's a pretty severe tooth problem. During the night, his shortness of breath increased. The patient used his inhalers, so he has a history of that. Within a few minutes, the patient went to his knees, had to lay on his back, and then went into respiratory arrest. Got oxygen, uh, albuterol, ipratropin, um, Albuterol, ipratropin, repeated chest compression for a systole. CO2 value was 100 by the eye gel. Um, IV 
Uh, EKG shows then now sinus tax, so we came out of a systole. Got some lidocaine, got some automidate, got some succinylcholine, and got intubated. CO2 after intubation is 100, and then it begins, so he had a cardiac arrest, and they arrived, so started moving, also tried to breathe on his own, so it's an asystolic ROSC. Uh, got some midazolam for sedation. Um, there's, we don't have a systole documented here, but we have a nice documentation of his return of electrical activity and pulses and a nice documentation of, although it looks like a decreasing CO2 at that point. Now we've got a better, nice CO2. Um, and a 12 lead doesn't show us any um, acute ischemic event. In the hospital, his final diagnosis was acute respiratory failure with hypoxia and hypercapnia. Uh, by the time they got it, I think his first recorded CO2 um, when it got there was in the 60s, high 60s, uh, and gradually improving. I don't remember that we had one other than that 100. The 100 is pretty impressive. Um, past medical history of COPD, hypertension, morbid obesity, hypoxemia, sleep apnea, and they said possible asystolic arrest because they didn't see the arrest. Uh, we had asystole on our, on our monitor that's asystole. Patient was extubated on hospital A2. He did have, uh, he had no evidence of infectious process, curiously. He had pulmonary vascular congestion, whether that was due to his underlying disease or to con acute congestive heart failure. Then it got better with Lasix, so they decided, what the heck. Uh, discharged him home on hospital day five to continue on a diuretic as well as his usual medications. So we'll probably see him again. That was a good case and a, and a, a, a good response to managing uh, somebody with a, I mean, when you get, when you get up to a CO2 of 100, you're, you're pretty cooking. Because what, what, why did he have his arrest? He had his arrest because of hypoxia and CO2. Case four. 65-year-old awoke this morning with acute shortness of breath and fulminant. That's worse than fulminant because he's really foaming at the mouth. It's a joke, guys. Fulminant pulmonary edema family calls from. Fires on scene giving O2 by non rebreather at 15 liters. Conscious and alert, very clammy and respiratory distress. Pinking up pink, spitting up pink frothy sputum. Family states he was fine at bedtime. He takes lisinopril for hypertension and a recent, he's had a recent hernia operation. I think it was within a week. No history of congestive heart failure, no pedal edema. So we have sudden onset of fulminant apparent pulmonary edema. Which can be cardiac, it could be a cardiac, uh, could be a, a disruption of a, um, could, be, could be an MI, it could be a disruption of the uh, mitral valve apparatus, it could be pulmonary embolus, could be a number of things, right? but sudden and acute with no history of congestive failure. Treatment. Placed on CPAP, patient's LOC decreasing, advanced to BVM, copious amounts of pink frothy sputum suctioned, um, Lasix given IV, 
<coughs> of significance, I note that no nitro was given. Patient's EKG changed from sinus tac to bradycardia of 30. Atropine given, patient lost consciousness, cardiac rhythm, Brady down to asystole to cardiac arrest. Placed supine, CPR started. Um, IGEL was placed, they couldn't visualize the vocal cords due to oral fluids. IGEL was placed, IGEL seemed to work. Uh, got four rounds of epi, was transported to the closest hospital, which was Legacy, um, for, um, because of the airway control, essentially. ETCO2 fluctuated from 14 to 35 during suctioning and transport with the eye gel. Um, Dr. Macht was the doc at the scene, and um, he, he was able to intubate the patient. He said, I intubated with mild difficulty with the CMAC, but by that time, uh, which is uh, one of the, one of the um, video lar laryngoscopes, um, by then, there had almost no secretions. The atropine would have helped the secretions, I suppose, in that sense. Uh, in the ED, he had a fine V-fib times two. We didn't respond to any, any interventions. Uh, a hypoxemic bradycardic arrest witnessed by the crew. Uh, called the code after 25 minutes in the ED. IGEL seemed to be oxygenating, but the first pH was 6.8, less than 6.8. If his CO2 was in the 30-ish range, which was reported, um, then, that, then that pH is all due to metabolic acidosis or long-standing respiratory acid. Probably, our guess is, this was a, mat a big PE. He just had a left hernia, hernia repair, I mean, within, within the month. He's a smoker no history of congestive failure, high likelihood then that this was, uh, um, you know, he developed the DVT through a big clot and ended up with a massive PE. Obviously, he did not make it. But this is a difficult case now. Uh, I'm not sure, I, I don't know what the blood pressure, see, his blood pressure was actually in the in the high range. So I think that, you know, for, for quote, pulmonary edema, congestive failure, if you're going down that track, I would have definitely tried some nitro as well. Once again, I don't think it would make any difference. It's just that's the pro. If you're going to use congestive heart failure as your protocol, follow congestive heart failure protocol. The, fun of the, 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 you know, it's kind of a busy, kind of a busy time from the sounds of this. Okay, don't forget, we still have one study going on. This is for AMR. We have the SUD study. So the patients we want to see, anybody who has, now who has a pre-hospital cardiac arrest, even if you get ROSC, as long as it's not an overdose, a traumatic death, draw a blood sample as soon as possible after you start the IVs. Label the tube with the patient's name, EMS number, data service. Put everything in a baggie that's in your rig and put it in the refrigerator at headquarters and they will take care of it, taking it away for you. This is to do genetic studies to see if there's any genetic markers for sudden cardiac arrest. Okay, any questions, any thoughts, any concerns? Stock market is up, so retirement's looking better. <laughs> which, which is stock market's up or my retirement's looking better? <laughs> yeah, uh, yes. All right, thank you. Um, next month again is skills sessions. So, and we'll see you again then.